Hey everyone and welcome to a very special video. We are here today with uh, Matteo Marson and Rob Ramirez to uh, talk with you about the new GL3 and Jitter Tools feature. So there is some very cool stuff coming up. But first let me introduce you Matteo Marson, which is the recent um, acquisition from the Jitter team. Probably you met him uh, online before with his uh, amazing content. He does some uh, extremely cool stuff with uh, shaders and jitter in general. So it's uh, a great addition to the jitter team. And then we got uh, with us Rob Ramirez, which of course doesn't need any introduction. And now I'll pass it to Rob, which will start to tell us about the cool object GGL PBR. Yeah, so I just wanted to give a quick uh, rundown of this um, brand new PBR object, JGL PBR, that we have introduced in 8.3. Um, this object functions very similarly to the JGL material object. Um, you have a um, object that creates a shader based on uh, properties in the scene and you can attach it to 3D objects. It sets the material attribute of that 3D object to the name of the PBR object and has a bunch of inputs for various image maps similar to JGL material. Um, in this patch here, um, there's just a few objects that I've pulled directly from the JGL PBR help file. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out is this um, new light type, hemisphere lighting. Um, this is new with 8.3. And this is just a uh, new way of lighting the scene that gives a little bit more definition to the object when you have only a single light in the scene. Um, the PBR object has a few different attributes, um, but the there are two that are sort of the um, kind of core attributes of the physically based rendering algorithm. They are called roughness and metalness, and you can start adjusting these and seeing how that affects the render um, right away. But what's more interesting with uh, PBR is to uh, look at these attributes when you have image maps. So I'm going to start looking at the different image maps that we have, and I'm going to start all the way on the right here with the environment map. Environment maps should not be unfamiliar if you've used uh, material before. Um, but what's new with uh, 8.3 and PBR is support for what are called equirectangular formatted image maps. And these are just image maps that are, instead of cube map formatted, where you have six squares on a plane, equirectangular, you basically have the full 360 view stretched out on a, on a rectangle here. And uh, we, we have support for uh, rendering out these equirectangular images in two different places, in cube map, um, you can now read um, read these files in and um, send it to something like a skybox, and that uh, image will be rendered on the skybox. Takes a minute. But you see here, um, the image doesn't look uh, that great. It's a little bit blown out and dark, and so, blown out in some places, dark in other places. So what we really want to do here is enable something called gamma correction. Um, on the cube map before we read the file in. So I'm going to reread the file with gamma correction and it's uh, all of a sudden looks great. So uh, cube map to the skybox is one way of rendering this, uh, this um, environment map, but for the PBR object, in order to actually use the environment map to light the um, object, we have to actually send that um, image map into the environment map input. And to do that, we're going to use something called jit.openexr. Now you may be noticing that I'm not sending the cube map directly in there. Um, the current version of JGL PBR only supports matrix inputs for its image maps. And this is something that will change um, soon enough. But for this version, this is, um, this is where we're at. We read the file in. Um, bang it out. And now we're using this image map as a lighting source. And this is something called image based lighting. Um, and once we've done that, we can really see some interesting stuff happen when we adjust like the metalness, if we crank the metalness all the way up, 
We crank the roughness down. We all of a sudden get a very shiny surface. And as you adjust the roughness on this, um, you get different sort of um, material properties. Um, and you can really hone this in. If we bring the metalness down, you get kind of, um, you can kind of get a cue ball type um, look. So there's just lots to play with with just a single environment map in these these two attributes. But of course there are several other attributes. So let's look at what those do. Um, if you look, if you open up the help patch, you'll see that you can start dropping in um, image maps onto the different inputs with these little utilities um, and. These are pretty helpful to just start playing around with how these different image maps affect um, uh, the rendering. So if you have um, if you have some PBR materials, which you can either make yourself or download from the internet, um, you can start dropping them in and uh, see how they uh, change the, uh, the rendering. So here we have just an albedo texture and an, um, and a normal map and we are seeing the different uh, ways that these uh, parameters can adjust the material. So we also have this uh, utility in the, um, in the help patcher that allows you to just drop the whole folder onto um, the object and you, you can get that uh, effect uh, rendered out with the different image maps. So here we're going to drop a leather um, a leather um, look. So this leather uh, effect has color, displacement, normal, and roughness. And um, the roughness map will um, modulate with the roughness parameter, but oftentimes you want to crank roughness, you, you want to set roughness uh, parameter up to one, the roughness attribute up to one, if you have a roughness texture. Um, but there, are, you know, that's just if you want um, you don't have to, uh, there's no rules here, so set it however you want. Um, the other thing that's worth looking at when we're starting to look at these image maps is this texture repeat uh, attribute that allows us to um, increase the number of repetitions of this texture across the object. We also have the ability to, if, you, if you've looked at the help patch before, you can see you, there's a link here to download um, a pack of uh, PBR maps. And these are really fun to just play with like the different looks that you can get. So you can actually take this entire folder and drop it here on this top section. And then we can kind of switch between um, the different effects that are loaded in here. And you start playing with um, seeing how the roughness changes the way things look. Now I want to um, look a little bit more at some of the um, more advanced attributes of Jitio PBR. I made a different starter patch for that. Um, and I'm going to drop this folder back onto here, turn on the renderer. Let's give ourselves an environment map to play with and um, also a um, send it to the skybox and then let's look at something like uh, paving stones. So by default uh, the PBR object is going to use the normal map for normals and it's going to ignore the height map if you want or the displacement map and if we look at this effect um, paving stones we see that there is a displacement map. So if we actually want to use that displacement map we have to enable something called parallax, uh, parallax uh, mapping. And when we have enabled parallax, we are no longer using the normal map. We're using the displacement map. And we have this parameter here called height scale that allows us to change uh, the amount of parallax, um, the extent of the parallax effect. And this effect might actually look better on some flat surfaces so that we can look at the open cube and see what it's doing. And we also probably want to, again, increase the texture repeat across this object. So it looks more like stones, maybe more like this. And then as we increase the effect, you can really see how the stones sort of pop out of the surface. Um, there are some other parameters here that are that are enabled when parallax is enabled. 
um, self-shadowing and there's a self-shadowing amount here but I really like to use this um, ambient occlusion amount and this um, this parameter only works if there is an environment map it, it, uh, it uses the environment map to help do this ambient occlusion um, and it uses the height scale as well um, the other advanced feature that uh, PBR exposes is something called um, tri um, biplanar and triplanar text generation and on, and in the current state of PBR biplanar and triplanar text gen do not uh, are not compatible with parallax mode so we're gonna have to turn parallax mode off and then we can start looking at what um, these modes do now the way that I, I feel like is uh, best illustrates what these modes do is to look at a shape like capsule which which doesn't have uniform texture coordinates as you can see on um, the way this is just the way the um, the object is rendered out these texture coordinates are stretching across and so it looks really distorted and kind of nasty but if we enable um, text gen mode if we do biplanar and triplanar you can see that all of a sudden you have these kind of really nice uniform texture coordinates um, across the shape and so that's where these these um, parameters really come in helpful. Um, biplanar is just a simplified version of triplanar. Triplanar is a little bit more advanced and has a, a separate attribute here for the amount of blending. Um, uh, and the details of this can be left to anyone that wants to research on the internet. Um, but I just wanted to uh, let you see why you might want to use this sort of thing. Um, and to give a little bit of a brief um, overview of the different functionalities involved with using JITGL PBR. So now I'd like to pass the mic over to Matteo, who um, is the original author of the JITGL PBR object, the, the prototype, the, the shaders that were involved in this. And he's got a lot of exciting things um, that uh, are we're hoping to get into some later releases. and. Um, he's going to show some of that off right now. So please take it away, Matteo. Thanks, Rob. So I'm going to show you some classified top secret projects we are currently working on. So let's start from this one. All right. So as Rob said previously, uh, up to this moment, we can only set some matrices as input for the maps. But of course, something we are planning to implement is a way to use textures as well. So what you can see here is uh, a sphere that is colored using GGL PBR, of course. And you can see that the albedo texture keeps changing because here we are using this GGL BFG object to create a procedural noise texture. But of course, you're not limited to use a texture just for controlling the albedo, but you can assign that to whatever you want. That could be height map, normals, roughness, and so on. So I already placed the very same texture in the height map input. And here, as I crank up this high scale parameter, you can see that it gets applied as well uh, as a displacement map. This may be used to create some dynamic high maps and create some procedural, uh, some materials created using procedural textures and so on. So all that good stuff. Uh, now, what you're actually looking at right now is not the same parallax mode that is currently implemented in 8.3. If you already played around with, um, with this object, maybe you found that it, parallax doesn't work great on curved surfaces. As soon as you try to apply that to, let's say, a sphere, you, or you can definitely see some issues at the borders. While this new parallax mode allows for a better parallax effect on curved surfaces. And besides, you can also see that here we have this nice silhouette around the shape. So let's try for a second to have fun with this. Let's try to change uh, some settings for this GGL BFG. Let's go for another kind of noise. I don't know, I like this one a lot. All these kind of things can be pretty useful as you try to, I don't know, for example, make something audio reactive 
or things like that. And of course, with this same mode, uh, parallax mode, uh, shadows, so self-shadowing and ambient occlusion still continue to work. Then we also decided to introduce something else. Uh, we decided to work on another layer for the height map. So why not introducing a secondary height map? Something that can be used to create even more details and bumps on the surface of this object. So here we have this secondary displacement. I already dropped in an image. I'm just sending a bang message. And here we can use a separate um, separate parameter to control the amount of parallax and the amount of displacement to apply this way. So as you can see, we can have uh, a rougher surface that, so basically another layer that gets stuck on top of the primary one. And this may be used to convey a better sense of realism. So I think that's it for the things we're currently working on for GGL PBR. Now I'd like to give you another sneaky preview of, of something else. I want to show you a, a couple of GGL pass effects that did not make it in the current release of Max, Max 8.3, but will be released as soon as possible. So let me show you those. So this is a new uh, pass effect. Uh, this one is called TAA, that stands for Temporal Anti-Aliasing. The idea is to create an anti-aliasing filter using the content of past frames. So we keep track of the previous frames, we store those in a history buffer, and then combining the current frame with the previous frames, we can achieve a sort of super sampling without using actually space or, or without the need to render a scene that is two, three, four, eight, or 16 times bigger than what we want. So uh, this kind of anti-aliasing is pretty efficient and looks great. Uh, here, let me zoom in a bit and stop the rendering for a second. Here you can see that on the left of the screen we have the anti-aliasing effect applied, while on the right there's no effect. And uh, if I take a magnifying lens, you can see pretty well the difference. So you can you can notice that all this jaggedness is, is completely gone. It's actually quite simple to use. You just plug it in and that's it. Set and forget. Now, let me show you another fact that is unreleased as well and that somehow shares the same overarching idea. This is the other effect. This pass effect implements a screen space ambient occlusion, but it does so using the same idea of temporal supersampling. You may be already familiar with ambient occlusion. It's a post-processing effect that is used to decide how much a given fragment is supposed to receive ambient light. And typically, this is done in screen space, casting a bunch of rays that test uh, the distance from that point in the scene to all the neighboring objects. And usually this requires a lot of rays to be done properly. This is how a normal screen space ambient occlusion looks like. But if we increase the amount of uh, accumulation, if you want, so if, you, if we increase this temporal super sampling, let's go for something like 0 0.9, you can see that the, the image gets way, way more stable and the result looks great. Okay, so this is it. Uh, but using the same concept, we can also do something else. We can, in fact, kind of approximate a global illumination. Okay, if we enable this feature, if I go here close to this statue, you can see that if I turn this one on and off, you can see definitely the difference. So the light bounces off all these objects and illuminate the rest. So as you can see here, we have some purple color on the floor, here a greenish tint. So everything, every object contributes to the global illumination. And this effect works as well with emissive materials. So we could try, for example, to turn this torus into something uh, emitting light. So if we change this matte emission parameter, let's crank this one up. Okay, and as you can see, we have this torus that is now emitting light. So this is it. This was just a preview of some stuff we are working on. So hope you enjoyed. Um, now it's time to let Federico talk, I guess.
Thank you so much to Matteo and Rob for the awesome presentations and uh, now I will just show you a couple more features and uh, then we will close the video. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is a new feature of the GGL Meshwarp object, which is part of the Digital Tools package. So let's get the GGL Meshwarp object and let's access its help file. All right, so some of you are probably familiar with the GGL Meshwarp object, is this uh, tool that we created to um, allow to have video mapping directly from within Max MSP. So I'll give you a brief overview of what the object does if you didn't know it yet, and then I will show you the new feature of the object. So the thing is that you can use this uh, uh, tool to basically map a video or an image or whatever you want to um, a surface, for example, a wall that is not exactly flat, so it will induce some distortion on your video. And then you can use the GGL Meshwork object to basically remap the video to the surface and don't have any distortion. And this you can do by dragging those vertices. As you can see, I'm doing it uh, just with my mouse. So it's very kind of uh, intuitive. You can uh, grab the vertices and move them and in this way distort the video. And this is thought for video mapping, but you can, of course, uh, use it for creative stuff. And we got another video about the GGL Mesh Warp as it was before. But uh, today I want to show you actually a new feature, which is the mask mode. A lot of you people ask for this uh, feature and it's now here. So it works like this. Um, this is my video. As you can see, I just reset it. And now let's say that I want to mask some portion of this video. Uh, if you go in this tab of the help file mask mode, you can see there is a bunch of toggles and instructions that show you how this works. So let's give it a go. Basically, uh, we first need to enable the mask mode. So as you can see, the, mesh, uh, the, the plane became kind of grayish. And now if I shift and double click, you can see that it creates this rectangle. Now this rectangle is actually our mask and I can use it to mask portion of this video. For example, let's say that I want to cut out this window in the chicken's video. All right, this looks pretty okay. And now I click here on apply mask and as you can see, it uh, masked everything else that is outside this rectangle. If you want the inverse, uh, which is to show everything that is outside this rectangle, I will just click here on invert mask and as you can see it inverted the mask. Then if I go out from mask mode, you can see that the video has been uh, masked. So that's pretty cool. Now there is a bit more stuff that we can do. For example, if I would like to mask the ramp where the chickens are coming down, um, I do the same. I shift and double click to create a new mask. And then if I shift and double click on uh, the edges of this uh, polygon that I just created, it, you can see that it will add new vertices. So these new uh, yellow dots, these are actually vertices that we can then move with the mouse and reshape our mask. So in this way, we can have pretty detailed, detailed masks. So if I click again into applying mask, you can see that now it applied the mask very well. And if I invert it, it will just show me it will just show us the part that I masked. So that's uh, pretty cool. Uh, we can actually move those masks around by pressing Command or Control on Windows and move those uh, masks around by clicking on the blue dot. And if we want to delete some vertices, we can again shift click on the vertices that we want to delete. And if we want to delete a complete mask, we can shift and double click on a complete mask. And that is as well the undo and redo features that we already got in GGL Meshwarp. So if you made a mistake, no worries, because you can just undo that passage. So um, that's it for the new feature of the Meshwarp. I hope you are going to like that and find this useful. Now I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to show you another little object, which is called JIT Gradient UI. So when you create a new object, you can write inside the JIT Gradient dot UI and this uh, object up here is actually a B patcher and let's check the help file. So what this object does is to create a gradient which is a monodimensional uh, matrix that contains a gradient of colors changing to another color 
and we can add as many colors as we want. So if I double click here on this uh, white area, I can create a new, what I call pointers. And uh, here you can change the color of this pointer by clicking on this rectangle here. And now it created, it modified the gradient. So it's giving us the matrix as an output. The matrix is in the um, OpenGL format, which means it has the alpha as the last plane. So it works correctly when applied, for example, to 3D shapes, as you can see here. And uh, yeah, we can use as many colors as we want. And we can set the dimensions of the output matrix in order to add more shades. Uh, one thing is that we can also set the alpha of those colors by, if we click here in the help file in edit messages, uh, we can set the alpha of the colors, which we will then see reflected uh, on the interface here of the object. And also you can see that these uh, 3D objects are actually going to disappear because the alpha is set to zero. And then the alpha will also be part of the gradient. So we'll interpolate between one color and the next one. So that's pretty much it. It is a very simple object, but I hope you will find it useful as well. So this was it. Uh, it was a bunch of new features. Um, we hope you will like them. Uh, if you try them up, uh, let us know what you think about them. And uh, thank you very much to Rob and Matteo for being with me. This was really cool. And if you want to get in contact with us, you can find us uh, on the Max MSP forum and on the Discord channel. So thank you again. And um, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Matteo. Thanks, Federico. Thanks. Ciao, ciao.